Greetings and pew 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 to you. It is long past the point where I should do another car bomb video. I already have two score follower type deals for my transcriptions of Black and Battery and From the Dust of This Planet. And then I also have that conference paper that I presented at the big Society for Music Theory meeting of 2020. Uh, but because that was an academic paper, I was able to take a lot of background knowledge for granted. And that is background knowledge that is definitely not common knowledge outside of the professional music theory world. So here we are for my 50th riff analysis video. I'm going to take a little bit more of a step-by-step -step approach to the car bomb song that I transcribed most recently from the dust of this planet. There are basically four sections in this song. The intro groove. The verses. Chorus. And the outro. Wake, wake up, and each of these sections raises a different, interesting, challenging thing about Carbomb's music. I'll talk about these sections in that order to try to give an overview of the breadth of intensely disorienting things that Carbomb does. If you get one thing out of this video, I hope it's that Carbomb's signature rhythmic sound isn't made up of just one technique. There are really a lot of conceptually very different things happening and being combined in a lot of really complicated ways that go into making their music feel as uniquely wacky as it does. I should also say up front that I'm pretty much just going to focus on the rhythmic stuff. I've barely started dipping my toes into all of the crazy pitch and effect stuff that Greg does, and I've gotten things set up so I can do a rough caveman approximation of his sound for this video, but a more detailed discussion about all of that stuff will have to wait for another video. So anyway, first, after a little intro burst, there's this super wonky groove. <laughs> While this is already extremely complicated by the standards of almost any metal band, what's happening here is pretty straightforward to explain, at least. There is a repeating guitar pattern that lasts for 14 16th notes, grouped as 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 3 plus 4. And then Elliot is playing cymbal hits every 6 16th notes. Because 14 doesn't divide evenly by 6, these hits phase against the guitar pattern. But because they play this guitar pattern 6 times through, it actually, the 6 16th note beat does actually line up again after every 3 times through the guitar pattern. <laughs> Then they do one of their signature moves, which I call a pulse-preserving tactus modulation. Basically, everything in the music stays the same, including the guitar and kick drum pattern, but the cymbal hits change to every four sixteenth notes. Because we're so used to listening to timekeeping cymbals as cues for what to hear as tempo, it feels like the tempo changes. So even though the 16th notes are actually exactly the same and the guitar riff hasn't changed, it feels completely different. Because 14 doesn't divide evenly by 4 either, this leads to another faster feeling phasing situation. And because the guitar riff is played three times, it ends by chopping one of those beats in half. So you'd have to play the guitar riff an even number of times for it to line up again with the beat that lasts for four 16th notes. And then there's one more pulse preserving tactus modulation where now the cymbals hit every seven 16th notes. This would fit evenly into the 14 16th note pattern, but now the guitar pattern changes and we get this quick non-repeating section that will lead into the first verse.
So like I said, this is already pretty complicated and a little challenging, but it's not too hard to put what's happening into words and numbers. These techniques are a big part of car bomb sound, and I've talked about them in a few other places. If you want more examples and details, I'll link those resources in the description. So after this intro groove, we get the first verse, which is really conceptually rich. Basically, there's this guitar pattern that goes short, long with two attacks at the end, short, long with one attack at the end. The kind of vague way I'm describing it will make sense in a little bit, so you can just calm down. In the first verse, that pattern looks like this. As a quick side note, being able to play this cleanly at tempo required a serious leveling up of my right hand technique. I've been able to play bleed all the way through for years. Uh, my very first riff analysis video was about the hardest part of that song. And I thought that after that, I was on top of the world. No right hand part would ever be difficult for me again, right? Turns out I was wrong. I even went down a rabbit hole of trying to do completely strict alternating picking on this riff because I thought that it would save some energy and that meant learning to start gallops with an upstroke, which is something you don't have to do at all in bleed. Uh, and this was kind of successful, but eventually I was able to play at a tempo without doing this and I just had to get faster and, and more precise and better endurance and everything. But guitarist issues aside, there are a couple of cool things about this section already. One is that now, instead of steady cymbal hits, Elliot is hitting a three plus four rhythm that, when they play it really fast like they do in the recording, almost sounds like a slightly wonky steady beat rather than an additive uneven thing. So rather than thinking of it as like, or rather than hearing it as like three plus four on a grid, it's so fast that, the, that it sounds kind of like, eh, uh, slightly faster, slightly slower, but the beat is essentially the same. They also manipulate this pattern a little at the end of this verse by taking away one of the attacks in every portion. That is, they rest for that time rather than articulating it. This isn't really a structural change because the structure of 16th notes stays the same. But at the very end of this verse, leading into the chorus, they do make a structural change. So remember how I define this guitar pattern super vaguely? It's because they actually flesh out this abstract idea in two different ways. First is the way that I already talked about, and the second is like this, where they add a 16th note to every beat, transforming it into a compound feel without changing the length of the 16th notes. <laughs> Things get even more complicated in the second verse when they switch rapidly back and forth between these two versions in this cool pattern that I won't try to explain with words, but I think is actually kind of easy to see visually, even if it is a complete brain melter to try to learn to play this. These rapid changes feel like the length of the beat is expanding and contracting because the distance between the cymbal hits is expanding and contracting. But at the same time, I think it's more straightforward to notate and think about this as the meter changing, not the tempo, because the length of the fast 16th note never actually changes. They're just adding and taking away 16th notes from the pattern. And at the same time, they're also not actually changing the pattern at all. They're just changing which version, which realization of the pattern they're using. This is what I find so fascinating about these pulse preserving tactus modulations from a conceptual music theoretical perspective. They seem to really reveal how inseparable and blurry the distinctions between tempo, rhythm, and meter are at a very fundamental level. And they show how clumsy our traditional notational system is for dealing with this sort of moment. This second verse also highlights another of Carbom's signature compositional techniques, which are built on these abstract manipulations of a durational pattern 
fleshed out in different tempo metrical contexts. John Moore and Yogev both have nice videos about the most famous and thorough example of this in The Sentinel, but it happens all over the place in Carbomb's music if you start looking for it. These are actually another kind of tricky thing to put into formal language. I've kind of settled on calling them contour preserving transformations because what stays the same is the rhythmic contour of the passage, that is the pattern of long and short, even if they're not necessarily preserving the absolute length or even the proportion of long to short between categories of attacks. So that's the intro groove and the verses. I've categorized things so far as complicated but rational in the sense that everything sits on a constant 16th note grid. Now it's time for things to get irrational. The choruses have a few recurring direct tempo changes. Instead of using a duration already in the music as a pivot, which is what was happening before, the band just jumps as a group to a new tempo. These are made a little trickier to hear because of the uneven, slippery guitar chord pattern and the lack of clear timekeeping symbols and the seamlessness of the change. <laughs> Even though the guitar riff stays the same and it's not that hard to play and it's not that hard to hear once you figure out what's going on, these direct tempo changes are kind of a conceptual black hole. Even if it's easy to say you just feel it, which is true, it's really hard to get our music theoretical fingers into these types of moments in a way that I was able to for the first two sections. So yeah, these direct tempo changes are also part of Carbomb's signature blend. And finally, there's the absolutely earth-shattering and completely maddening outro section, which sounds like this. When I transcribed the song, I put all of this on a metric grid in order to have like a visual representation of it, but I find this metric grid pretty much impossible to feel and kind of useless for learning to play this, and it's not even entirely accurate when you try and line it up really carefully with the recording. So I have reasons to believe that it actually makes more sense to think of this as entirely off the grid. At least for me, I had to learn this section by kind of like brute force memorization rather than practicing with a metronome. The verses I spent hours and hours with a metronome and that helped, that was because it's all on a grid. With this, it's it was listening to the recording a bunch of times and figuring out how long the pauses between these little blasts are. If you're a guitarist who's going to give it a shot, I found it most helpful to think in terms of counting downstrokes rather than trying to keep track of the faster level. And then I just learned to feel the space between these downstrokes by listening a million times. But yeah, I hear a lot of moments in Carbomb's music as off the grid like this. And like the direct tempo changes, these moments defy explanation, at least the sort of literal, graphic, rational explanation that I was able to give for the intro groove and the verses. So anyway, here's my attempt at a full playthrough, and I don't want to be dramatic, 
but this is almost certainly the most time that I've spent trying to get a playthrough down for this channel yet. So yeah, Car Bomb's secret sauce has a lot of ingredients, and this video just barely scratches the surface, even rhythmically speaking. If any of the Car Bomb gentlemen are watching, I'm very much hoping to pick your brains about all of this. Pew pew pew, and see ya.